Hello and welcome guys to another episode on FPGA topics and today we are talking about cache design in FPGAs. So as most of you probably already know, caches are used as fast memories where there are other memories involved which have longer latencies and uh, and then there is there is coherence if you have multiple uh, devices trying to access memories etc so to set the context of um, why caches are needed and what the problem in more detail what the problem is let's just take a very simple hypothetical example that we have a library uh, and the library's books and computers and resources are all on the moon let's say and you have people who are trying to get this resource from earth Okay, so you have two people lined up here, and let's say you have several counters on Earth from which you can reserve a book or get a book, right? And so the first person comes in, sits at the first counter, and asks for, let's say, you know, their favorite book, let's say Lord of the Rings. And so a request is sent to the moon. The moon then queries the database, sends back um, the response, and then the terminal on this side would basically try to reserve that, change the bit in the record and send it back saying, okay, the person in the yellow color has the Lord of the Rings, okay? And now imagine if a second person right behind this person wants to come in and wants to reserve Lord of the Rings as well. What happens is that the second person comes in, sits at the next terminal, and um, it's it'll take a while before the first person will actually complete the... Uh, read, modify, commit cycle for reserving the book. So if the second person read comes in, sits down at the next terminal, then that reservation may not work because that read, modify, uh, write, and commit cycle hasn't completed yet for the first person. And if you try to interfere in the middle, you will read the wrong values. So that's the fundamental problem with the cache. Now, um, how does this apply, and we'll take another example in a, in a moment here, how does it apply to our FPGA design and hardware design in general? So in FPGAs, um, when you try to access longer latency memories, external, external memories like DDR3, DDR4, HPA memories, there is, just like this Earth and Moon analogy, there is a long delay latency when you try to read the record from the DDR. When you try to modify it, it, it takes maybe a few clock cycles. And then when you try to push it back into the DDR, it's gonna take another uh, latency. So this read, modify, commit cycle is what you have to be very careful about because read, modify, commit cycles can take time and latencies. And then if you want to process things at a high rate without wasting time, then you have to make sure that the next um, you know, action that you're going to do behind another already in play action, you have to be able to uh, uh, read the data correctly and the state correctly so that the memory state is not reflected um, in an incorrect way. Now, uh, if we look at a realistic example from an FPGA perspective, I show here a very simple case. Uh, where two transactions happen. Now, let's go back to this analogy and think about it, that what if this person in red was not wanting Lord of Rings? What if they wanted, you know, some other book, uh, like Harry Potter? And so in that case, there is no conflict. And so we'll take a quick example here. Um, sorry, let's just back up here. Um, so we'll take a quick example to see um, what happened here. So what happened here is that the first one is trying to uh, read from address 11 and the second one is trying to read from address 12. So so um, in this example, I guess the first transaction here is address 11. The second transaction is trying to address 12 and for the sake of simplicity, let's just say we are incrementing the value in that memory location. So the first location had value 50 in the beginning of time. Second location is value 25. 
So when this guy comes in, the first thing you'll do is read. And the lookup has to complete at this point. And when the lookup completes, he's trying to read 11, so he, he gets 50. And then you'll try to add one and then try to write back. And the write back finishes here. So the memory is updated with 51. Likewise, the second guy comes in here, reads 25, which comes out here. He, he knows that they are, the value is 25 plus one and tries to write back. It gets written here as 26. Now see the problem here. The lookup happened here and this, this update happened here. And so only at this point, the memory gets updated with 51, right? So now um, if you imagine that both of these transactions were trying to update um, the, uh, the same data, which is that they were both trying to access um, the uh, location uh, 11, which is let's, in the sake of uh, example, let's say both of them are trying to get Lord of the Rings book issued to them. So what will happen is that the first guy comes in, he reads, he reads 50, okay? He modifies, makes it 51. Second guy comes, but it comes so quickly right behind this first transaction that when he issues a read and the lookup completes here, the memory is only updated here. So the lookup has happened before the memory is updated, which means he'll read 52. And if he tries to update it, he'll try to write 51. So what has happened? It seems like both have been issued Lord of the Rings. And, and so the answer is wrong. It should have been 52 here. So now, uh, let's introduce the cache. So what happens is the first transaction, which is a little bit ahead of the second transaction, comes in, does a lookup. It reads 50, but it also has a cache, and the cache is reading 50 as well. So he updates the cache saying, now I'm done, and my cache is reading 51, because that's what the new state of the memory will be. And then he issues a write or commit to the memory, which, which will happen here. At this time, it will commit to 51. The second read came in just you know a, a tad bit behind this first one so it reads 50 as well from memory and then when it reads 50 it also checks at the cache and it sees that the cache is the more current one and the cache is saying 51 so it uses 51 here instead of the 50 and it updates it stores in the cache as 52 and does write back and the write commit happens here as 52. so you see that the cache has essentially made sure that you can operate at high bandwidth. You don't have to wait for the first transaction to fully flush and commit before starting the second one because that would have killed your bandwidth. And now in this case, you can do transactions pretty fast. Um, just back to back, you can do these transactions, which is um, beneficial for the bandwidth and the high throughput in your design. So now that you've done that, you've protected yourself against this hazard of latency because you know that you will have the latest greatest data available in your cache um, and then it'll be committed correctly. So um, those were some of the problems. We talked about the storage replacement problem that you know you have to store um, the data, the most recent data into the memory uh, in cache somehow. Now the caches can have various mechanism. You could have just a FIFO that just shift register here so it only remembers the last, you know, end transaction. So you could be set associative, where you, you know, you size your cache big enough that you can store certain part of the memory into a location, and then you can see what was the last uh, address location. So there's various mechanisms, and and I'm not going to go into more detail on these mechanisms, but you have to be aware that that when you design your cache, you have several options. And the simplest option, I would say, is just a shift register or FIFO. And you can remember the last N transactions. And it's high, very high likelihood that within those N transactions, you know, whatever memory elements you're trying to write or commit to the memory would have gotten updated. Let's say the total DRAM latency was 50 clock cycles. So as long as you cover this cache with 50 uh, clock cycles worth of last transactions, you'd probably be able to um, cover yourself um, for any um, consistency issues or coherency issues you might have across transactions. So that's the first um, important thing to notice. The second important thing to notice is the depth of the cache. If this cache is too shallow, 
then you may not be able to cover the full latency. And plus there may be a FIFO here so that when the lookup engine issues uh, transactions, some of them have not even reached the point where they are executed by the controller. So there's extra latencies of FIFOs in the middle and maybe multiple FIFOs, one on the right side, one on the read side, etc. So you have to also consider the depth of these FIFOs and your cache has to cover you for these FIFOs plus the latencies and so on. So a good uh, data path designer would take into consideration both of these things. Uh, what kind of policies you're applying, what kind of latencies are involved here. And based on both of these, you will design your cache to cover yourself against all the consistency coherency issues that you might face. Lastly, uh, how do you see this cache going to even higher performances? One of the things datapad designers will run into is, let's say is the clock um, static timing analysis on let's say one lookup engine. And you can only scale up the clock frequency so much, and then your performance will be limited by your clock frequency. So if you're stuck with a certain clock frequency and you can only get so much throughput, but your memory has got a lot more bandwidth, the alternative is then to have multiple lookup engines. And if you have multiple lookup engines, then the question becomes, well, then how do I make my cache work across multiple engines? So there are some other ways by which you can use multi-port memories, multi-port uh, RAMs um, so that all these engines are in real time updating this cache and getting the right values from the cache despite the fact that there are multiple engines. So that design requires you to understand how multi-port caches can be designed. And again, I'm not gonna go into detail, but I just want to mention that there are live value tables or XOR approaches um, by which you can create these multi-port caches. And these multi-port caches can help you scale your throughput even further from one lookup engine to n lookup engines. And that's um, you know the, uh, the scalability problem that you will face. So um, that sums up this topic um, for this episode. And um, hopefully you, know, you understood and enjoyed uh, what the intent of this uh, introductory cache topic was, is to see what the problems there are and how the data path designers uh, face the challenges of um, applications that uh, access large amounts of memory at very high rates. And to keep these um, aligned, you have to make use of caches so that you can uh, design these correctly with consistency and coherency and uh, not have gaps in your, uh, in your uh, memory lookups. And with that said, I guess, um, uh, if you haven't subscribed to my channel, please do subscribe. It helps me um, and uh, it probably, if this helps you, uh, I would also feel good about that. So um, thanks for watching this video and I'll see you in another episode. Until then, take care and bye-bye.